It's Landon Darrance, Senior Director of the Atlantic Council Global Energy Center. I'm in Sharm El Sheikh, Egypt at COP27, where we're digging into what the global community is doing about climate action to advance uh, a clean energy future and net zero future. I'm here today with Bahad Ajlan, who is the president of CAPSAR, the King Abdullah Petroleum Studies and Research Center in Riyadh. And it's great to see you here, Bahad. Thank you. So, so as I've talked to the stakeholders throughout the conversation here in COP, people are referring to this as the implementation COP. It's a COP of action. And, and I'm curious to have your perspective in terms of uh, how CAPSARC is, is uh, experiencing that conversation and, and what you're expecting to come out of COP27. So I think, um, you know, looking back at COP26 and then moving you know, to 12 months you know, later at COP27, uh, the focus has been on action. And we've seen this in a few things. And so we've seen a lot of mid-term targets. And I think we've seen in prior to COP26, all these net zero ambitions, and these were great. However, what we wanted is actually specific actions and how we're going to get there. And the importance of setting mid-term targets, things that we want to achieve in 2030, how can we achieve them? What are the specific, what are the details? How can we hold you know, people accountable? And so for me, it's always you know, enjoyable when we see Targets not only in 2030, mm -hmm. but targets like what Saudi uh, Green Initiative announced for uh, CCUS capturing 9 million tons of CO2 by 2027. And so it's very important to merge between the long-term ambition, the net zero, but also what are we doing in the meantime to get there. And so that has been an important part. The second part is, I mean, being here in Africa, we have to talk about development finance and the pledge for the $100 billion. And again, we need to be also very careful about this because the 100 billion is not enough, but it can help unlock more funding that can come from the private sector, from development institution, from pension fund. And so we need to make sure that the development funding is available, mm -hmm. but then we need to make sure that we innovate in the business models that would unlock these private investment. Well, that's, that's incredible. And I think on, you know, one observation here is obviously we're gonna have two cops in the region back to back. Uh, and, and what does it mean, you know, for, for a region universally seen as a producer, you know, an, an oil and gas producing economy uh, centric model? What does it mean in terms of how you can be enablers uh, of, of clean energy technology moving forward? So I think uh, it's two, twofold. First, not only is the you know, region impacted by its export, which are, you know, heavy industry, uh, but also a lot of, you know, hydrocarbon export. But then they're also affected by, you know, global climate change more than other regions. And so it's very important that when we look at, you know, mitigation, we also look at adaptation. And so the region needs to build this resiliency into, you know, their future thinking. How can we look at, you know, our future invest investment and future infrastructure for our energy transition that are not only, you know, going to service to get there, but then will be resilience, you know, to uh, weather impact, to, you know, climate change. And so that's important. And it, it's really important that we focus today in COP27, but tomorrow in COP28, I don't making sure that we do this. And so it's very important that we've seen, you know, a lot of announcements, especially led by Saudi and the UAE, setting future targets for, you know, CCUS, clean hydrogen. A lot of these are important. We've seen, you know, um, net zero ambition uh, that's the, the two countries set, but also at the corporate level. And I think it's very important that those corporate, the state-owned enterprises, set their own target, which will drive, you know, a lot of the private sector, you know, um, investment. And so by doing that, they brace themselves for the change. They make sure they build resiliency. But then we also need to talk about, you know, what do they do? So hydrogen is one example, CCUS, direct air capture, as well as nature based thing. And so all of these have been done, not that they're not investing in oil and gas, they're you know, actually investing more in oil and gas, investing in technologies to reduce, you know, methane intensity, uh, carbon uh, intensity. How can they bring in, you know, global methane uh, uh, emissions below mm -hmm. and comply with the global methane pledge? So all of these things have been set. And I think we want to see more when it comes to that. Uh, but also, I think we want to see it expand. And so we've seen it in a few countries, especially in the Gulf region. But we would like to see it, you know, expand beyond in the MENA region. We've seen, you know, a lot of, especially investment in Egypt with, with green hydrogen, but we would like to see it actually expand more. And I think the benefit does not only, you know, output to those countries, it, it acts globally, 
So we see high deployment, you know, lower cost, more knowledge sharing. And so it's very important. And I think that's why we really are excited, even though, you know, we've seen a lot of bad things happen in the last 12 months, especially when energy security, the conflict in Ukraine. Yet we see a lot of promising, you know, action when it comes to climate. Uh, we see in the Inflation Reduction Act, which set clear targets for clean energy transition. And that's important because, you know, what happens in the U.S. does not stay within the U.S. border. It actually, you know, filter and, you know, goes and other people can copy it and actually deploy the same solution at a lower cost. You bring up the concept and, and discussion about uh, Russia, Ukraine, broader energy security trends. And let's dig into that a little bit. You know, there was a lot of sentiment that perhaps uh, energy security would weigh on the climate conversation here at COP. Um, I don't know your experience. I think that there's uh, still a lot of momentum uh, for the climate agenda in spite of that. But I, I'd be interested to hear your perspective in terms of how we meet the near-term energy security needs with the long-term uh, climate ambition that's being presented uh, at COP27. So I agree with you that we have actually seen more renowned, you know, more renewed action for climate, even though we are seeing more people appreciate the the trilemma, the energy security and the energy affordability, because it's important that we speak about those two in addition to climate. However, we've seen this, you know, and actually what happened, we've seen positive development. I've cited, you know, the Inflation Reduction Act, which is, you know, part of it is addressing energy security, but a big part of it is addressing, you know, climate sustainability. And so we need to make sure that, you know, all of these add up rather than, you know, actually close down. And so we need to be very careful about the localization of supply chain. Yes, we need diversity in the supply chain, but we shouldn't go into, you know, localization and driving the cost up. I think it's very important that we actually have, you know, a fair and, you know, uh, energy transition and just energy transition. And part of it is that, you know, having this trust within local communities, but we cannot, you know, have a bigger dynamic, you know, attitude to trade and to supply chain, because otherwise we would drive costs up rather than cost down. And we know that the challenge is actually driving the cost down for you know, emission abatement. I really appreciate your perspectives here as we meet up in COP27 and uh, wish you a really fruitful rest of the, uh, the time in Egypt and look forward to seeing you in the region and, and perhaps at COP28 as well. Thank you. Bye.